one of the most tenacious beliefs amongst prominent scientists, although in more recent years it's a belief that has been challenged by a number of marginalized mavericks, states that self-awareness is simply the byproduct of a higher functioning brain. In scientific terms, self-awareness does not exist. It's an illusion. However, anybody who actually is self-aware, as opposed to just being an old-fashioned stuck-in-the-mud zealot, would quickly recognize that this is an impossible precept, especially when one stops to ask the question, if self-awareness is just an illusion, exactly who is it meant to be fooling? Cheers for the lift. I'll let you know where the spin-off series goes. Did I hear sleigh bells in the background of that street scene? Unfortunately, yes. This must be the Christmas episode that Seems that way, doesn't it? In February. I know, it gets earlier every year. Personally, I've come to regard Christmas rather like sex. Initially, there's loads of excitement and expectation and food and alcohol and stuff, but once the main event is over, I don't want anything to do with it again for the next 12 months. That's a very male attitude, Lawrence. You certainly changed since our lesbian scene above the wall is back in episode 7 of the original scene. I had to, there was custard wedged up me crack. Well, it's not in the spring, but really good Christmas special this is the Christmas episode. There will be robins and things slow. There will be sprouts and frozen toads of what race roasted wind is knows and lots of sentimental clothes. But that's just how the bastard goes. <laughs> Previously on the Lawrence Pendlebury Adventures, following their attempts to bring the great intergalactic war skidding to a halt by foolishly rewriting history, Lawrence and Polly inadvertently burst the skin of time's gigantic bubble. This unsurprisingly resulted in the whole of history becoming snarled up in one chaotic knot, along with some atrocious Shakespearean acting by the cast. Unable to mend the rip themselves, the time-travelling society's answer to little and large embarked instead on an heroic quest to track down God and ask for his help. The Jewish stroke Christian god, that is. We don't want to wake up tomorrow morning with a bomb in the dustbin. Tighten the stays on your spanks, Polly, you pickled onion. Preferably not too tight, otherwise you'll end up looking like an overinflated balloon animal again. We're coming into land in Santa's mine on Mount Olympus behind the Grouse Special Reserve Distillery. As you've probably gathered, I couldn't be bothered conducting any research for this episode. Santa Claus? The big fat bastard who turns up at Lewis's every Christmas with nicotine stains on his beard, swearing at the kids. I thought we were going in search of God. Father Christmas, Jehovah, Yahweh, Fred Talbot, I don't keep up with the latest theological discoveries, to be honest. He's just some ancient paedophile with legal access to children's bedrooms, that's all but I know. Santa's a fictional character, Lawrence. The inevitable commercialisation of the anthropomorphised pagan spirit representing the feast of the winter solstice. And a 40-foot dune a long robe with a drift hedge beard floating about on the clouds of real, is he? Or two fourth wall breaking idiots with nothing better to do on a Saturday night than record this rubbish charging around the universe in a telephone box, come to that. Button your lip, Polly, me old butterball chicken, or at least clamp it shut with a couple of industrial Devices. We're heading for the composting behind the reindeer pens. This landing's about to get bumpy. <laughs> early 20th century, as British working classes rallied behind David Cameron to rewrite the European Constitution in favour of the British government, encouraged in their anti-continental fervour by Rupert Murdoch's furious headlines regarding bent bananas, little did they realise that Cameron was in fact abolishing the Human Rights Act. In one fell swoop, the rights of ordinary people to speak out against Tory injustices were washed away like turds down an unclogged drain, along with their own welfare safety nets. As a result, by 2020, the year in which Lawrence and Polly are currently mired, every workforce under right wing rule had become fully automated, leaving great swathes of the unemployed starving in the gutters alongside the disabled that they themselves had abandoned several years previously. Even Santa's workshop had now become mechanised, leading to the infamous elves' mass suicide of 2019, and the horde of pepper pots now swarming through the factory gates in the twatter's direction. Oh great! Pepper pots. Marks and Sparks must be holding a waste paper basket sale. Wait, wait, get your fetching exhaust pipe off my eye stalk, you little metal ball bag. Lawrence Pendlebury and Polly Jenkins, you will accompany us to Santa's grotto. Any attempt to escape will result in us sticking our egg whisks up your own. the idea. Like the sun's house, by the way. Very festive. Returning to self-awareness for a moment, while Lawrence and Polly are being frog-marched towards their doom, the scientists who claim that self-awareness is only an illusion should take a more inclusive approach to their fellow professors, particular quantum physicists who inform us that it's actually the universe that isn't real and that reality only exists because self-awareness wants it to. The scientific establishment on the whole resembles the civil service in that respect. Individual departments failing to communicate with each other so that it all becomes one incomprehensible mess. However, our heroes have reached Santa's grotty. It was a proper grotto once, well, government cuts and all that. 
Mr. Jelly Belly and Mr. Blemish. <laughs> Welcome to hell. Oh, bloody hole and all that. Bollocks. Excuse the stain on me beard. The devil thanks for repeating on me. I must be honest, your grot hole isn't exactly how I imagined it would be, Santa. The one at the co-op when I was a kid looked more convincing than this, and that was constructed from milk bottle tops. These wooden toys are covered in splinters and suffering from woodwork. I don't see better craftsmanship on Blake's having props. Blame that Italian bastard David Oil of you Matrix cabinet and his dead pig screwing mates. <laughs> we were supposed to produce 40 million clockwork train sets with no bastard elf surface, just these annoying metal bellends at their sink plunges, and two thirds of the budget's already been allocated on swans necks for the aristocracy to wipe figgy pudding clinkers from their festive arses. Not exactly full of seasonal spirit, are you? Although your beard certainly stinks of it. Um, Rat ass on sprout hoot with extra eggnog for medicinal support. Those surely be dads are threatened to pay for these. <laughs> if I don't add an extra 3,000 chimneys to be list, most of them are up to court. How am I supposed to do that? I don't mean Duncan Smith can't and Rudolph off with his boxing day venison platter. I wouldn't mind, but I don't get paid for doing this crap anyhow. Welcome to the big fucking society, folks. But you're Santa, the embodiment of Coca Cola's goodwill to all mankind. Boy, to that, you overweight ganglion. Listen, fatso, I'll tell you what. I'm a bowl of this plutonium grade pudding, and I'll let Paul the sinking proton in her express me sentiments in song. And yes, we have got sinking atoms at the North Pole. Buggers get everywhere. The worst of bloody minion memes on Facebook. There's a and my little slow ones woe for the sick one and slain. The Sally Arms nearly carol down their square. The street sells it through the roof that we bags with his fires while you can stuff your fucking Christmas up your ass. It's just grass and sick and pigs are fun, it's for every happy home. Whilst the lonely old and destitute are left to fend alone. The stench of spice and aftershave, the hypocrisy and horns are out with his passions while smoke and wax shall come from the board. And celebrate their little rooms, they'll care to come and burn. Stop coming up its paths and slopes, and say to the turns, they never speak to any other time. Because they're really bastards, but they have to meet up every year. The cases once are last, the rapid of this year is not just twats of broken festive cheer. Don't like the tapas and the cripples, they make homes through the year. And all the sentimental television networks are the past, and you can stop your fucking Christmas up your ass. <laughs> I've said it before, albeit in series one as Laura, but I could make a fortune out of these sinking atom swatters. What exactly was in that Christmas pudding, Left, It's squatting in my stomach with all the intensity of an angry sack of King Edwards. I don't suppose there's somewhere I could drop a yule log. There's a bog behind you. The door with the wreath on it. Whatever you do, don't open the one on the left. And watch out for Mrs. Claus's laundry. The suet skin marks in her bloomers have taken on a life of their own. <laughs> What the? What did I just tell you? Not the one on the left, I said you walking brain fruit. You've let the bloody crampers out. Five hundred years it's been locked up in there with nothing but me mouldy socks to it. Oh, it must be ravenous me how. One sixty now with the pepper box, it might even start on as the microwave meals in the fridge, depending on how desperate it is. Oh, Krampus. I thought the sign said Crap House. It's probably time I've booked an optician's appointment. The origins of the Krampus are shrouded in Austro-Bavarian folklore, but essentially, throughout European history, this terrifying creature served as Santa's massive, horny sidekick, a child punisher, infamous for beating the crap from badly behaved kiddies with his birch. Those children deemed beyond redemption were forced instead to sit through an entire Christmas episode of Heartbeat. Once popular amongst the aged, the Krampus eventually fell out of favour and was locked up in Santa's broom cupboard after Jimmy Savile kicked the bucket. I am the Krampus, otherwise known as Steve on social media. It is my ancient spiritual right to determine which children should receive expensive presents and which should be thrashed within an inch of their lives, thrown down the nearest drain and heavily shat on by the British aristocracy. I hold in my hirsute claws to this scrolled in atmospheric cochineal, one containing the names of Tory voters and Atos employees, the other those of benefits scrounging maggots and bone idle wheelchair users from council estates. Bet you can't guess which one is which. Not very well long, is he? I expected more from a pagan icon. What? Seriously. Look at him. I've seen more prominent genitalia on action, pal. The water on the Gruffalo's nose is bigger than that. That's a Tory, Polly. 
That's how God constructs them. Out of my way, sushis. I'm Mickey Sanders Slay. There's 500 years of death and mayhem to catch up on, and a visit to the old mate Rolf and Stafford Jail. First stop, however, Lancashire, for some flat cap and races broth. Never could stand those arrogant working class sheep shaggers. But this sack of PlayStations and other ones can go for a start. What we require here is a Gatling gun. It was designed by American inventor Dr. Richard J. Gatling in 1861. But at least one of us could be bothered doing his research. Give you Prancy a wild eyed set of backpipes before I have your sweet friends on a bar cake. Well done, Polly. You've unleashed an industrial strength. Ian Duncan Smith on the whole of history. We've got to stop it. Oh yeah, that's right. History's still mixed up, isn't it? Not the bad that. The previous episode seems a long way off now. To the twat allowance, me old albino golly. There followed the customary silent movie-style chase scene, full of inappropriate, cobbled-together sound effects and speeded-up music, here to provide the listener with a more comprehensive commentary is Derek Thompson Electron. You join us now in this, the second bump of a glorious morning at the North Pole, where the race to save the planet Earth's handicapped is underway. The Krampus, Bookie's favourite, has taken a note of the lead by one was clear back as he ran the show for the Finland with the twat over the city to one in gross pursuit driven by the sufficiently sharp of massively overweight Polly Jenkins. Stuart Hall is on the inside and trailing at the rear of the rickety handcart, being pulled by Zaddy Poe's wife, Cedric's tip of the day, Santa Claus, they're 300 to 1 against. We ran with Bell End of Norway, and the Krampus remains ahead, scattering broken toys in his wake. Othering Nora, the twat has collided with asteroid B612, sending a flat and her child spinning into the back of the space along with his pet sheep. It looks as though Lauren Pendlebury and Paul Jenkins are headed for the new factory. And the frigid coal hose into size emerging from the suburb of Valleys at Lancashire, along with several chimney pods, the Krampus ahead now by a full length of that old Flynn. But wait, what's this? I late comers enter the fray as Charles Windsor, using the Christmas floods as a photo opportunity to restore his reputation. Wins and the Krampus are neck and Adam's apple in the self serving stakes. It's going to be a Photoshop finish. Meanwhile, outside the Burnian, not far from Oslo, the sort of handcart you'd more normally associate with the Fulda Country Life Museum lies bent and broken in a blood-spattered snowdrift, two paper chains of Wellington boot prints snaking towards the lobby. I warned ya, what did I say? Don't go recklessly driving in that condition, you're as mad as a cranky sage as a wife swapping gig, but would you listen? Oh, of course not, I'm fetching Santa Claus, I am, I'm about suspicious about now, you have and done it, you turgid scrot, you have chilled back kid in his tartan dressing gown and his pet's home and haven't yet, you gormous great sauce, they'll have your license off you this time, mark my words. Shut up, you fat old bird. Don't think I haven't caught you, I ain't that new jail bait elf in the complaint department neither. She's a proper little Santa's elf, she is. Never seen such a short and shooting in all born days, these gasting trollop. Well, if you're contemplating giving her extra help and pudding for a bonus, think again. You the lace couple of the only if you get a first sort of don't a clap. I thought you were not in bitch. At precisely that moment, somewhere deep inside the Cooper Belt, caught in the orbital plane between the dwarf planets of Humia and Makey Makey, pockmarked with wayward meteorites, and now sporting a flattened rose, the twatter span helplessly towards the wastelands of eternity. Right, that should do it, Polly, me sea slug. Can't travel through space with bent furry dice. Now to sort the engine out before the Krampus starts wreaking havoc. It might be a bit late for that, Lawrence. Take a look at our second-hand lighting sensors rediffusion television set painted silver to resemble a monitor. <laughs> Clark, the Krampus is auditioning for a job at the DWP down there. This is dreadful, Polly. It's nothing short of a full-blown return to the bad old days before corporal punishment was out Didn't he serve under Captain Mannering in the Home Guard? Back when innocent children were mercilessly disciplined into subservience, stuffed up chimneys on the end of the pole and expected to be seen but not heard, when teenagers weren't allowed to give adults lip or swear their heads off in Asta Car Park or spit on amiable coppers without the reprisal of a swift cuff round the ear or do whatever they wanted regardless of other people's well-being, when schoolhouses were places of learning rather than youth clubs. Of course, we are on an extremely urgent mission to find God. Extremely urgent, Lords. To the exclusion of all other matters, I reckon. We haven't really got time to stop the Krampus, what with one thing another. And you've got to reattach the bog seat before we set off as well. Yes. On reflection, I'm sure the whole Krampus matter will sort itself eventually. In the meantime, we'd better continue our heroic quest and not look back. After we've had a brew, of course, and a couple of French fancies. <laughs> And some Jaffa Cakes. You have been listening to the Lawrence Pendlebury Adventures, Episode 3, Carry On Krampus, or alternatively, the Laura Pendlebury Adventures, Episode 22, Lawrence and Polly Find Santa's Wrinkled Sack. Depending on how you read the canon of this rubbish, in honour of shoe size, this episode starred Carrie Black as Hattie Jakes, Terry Sedwick as Jim Dale, and Brian Hughes as the late Charles Hawtrey, and the even later Simon the Alcoholic Wonder Dog. The incidental music was discovered beneath a mound of jazz magazine. Nish Richards and Paul the Proton's Christmas song was produced by threatening Pinky and 
spooky with a bacon knife. Don't forget to tune in next time, Pendlebury Souls, to the allegedly exciting spin-off series, Inspector Bolestra, man of a thousand unconvincing accents. <laughs>